now I think we're getting right at the heart of what democracy is all about when uh, we're at loggerheads over who should be allowed to vote and, and who shouldn't. Hello and welcome to the G Zero World Podcast. This is where you'll find extended versions of my interviews on public television. I'm Ian Bremmer. And today, is it getting harder to vote as a black person in America? In the 2012 presidential election, black voting surged to 67%, but by 2020, it had dropped to 63. Much of that decline was probably due to an enthusiasm gap with Barack Obama no longer on the ticket, but some experts fear that new restrictive voting laws, primarily from Republican state legislatures, will only drive that number further down. Are these new laws really about making it harder to vote? Or are they about making it safer to vote, as many Republicans argue? I'm joined today by syndicated Chicago Tribune columnist Clarence Page. He once won a Pulitzer covering voter fraud. Let's get to it. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, understands the value of service, safety, and stability in today's uncertain world. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. G Zero World would also like to share a message from our friends at Foreign Policy. How can sports change the world for the better? On The Long Game, a co-production of Foreign Policy and Doha Debates, hear stories of courage and conviction, both on and off the field, directly from athletes themselves. Ibtihaj Muhammad, Olympic medalist and global change agent, hosts The Long Game. Hear new episodes every week on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Clarence Page, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. So I want to start, of course, with the Voting Rights Act. And uh, I mean, I've seen that it's been functionally blocked by all the Republicans and indirectly, I guess, by both Senators uh, Sinema and Manchin. Uh, you support it. You've said it's very important uh, that, we, that we get this done uh, for American democracy and for enfranchisement. Walk us through what it is and why it's so important. Well, the uh, Voting Rights Act is important uh, for, well, for one thing, for me personally, uh, I was coming out of high school when that Voting Rights Act was passed a year after the uh, Civil Rights Act, and it changed the lives of, of black folks and the rest of Americans. The main thing is that was what ended uh, the uh, residue of Reconstruction when uh, the uh, vote had, had been uh, given to uh, black folks after slavery. Uh, the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments uh, were passed, and uh, the uh, Voting Rights Act was necessary because the Jim, the Jim Crow regime had uh, virtually taken away the right to vote for Black folks across the South, and uh, it, it was a uh, uh, very important uh, decision the Supreme Court made a few years ago by uh, t uh, taking away the uh, right to preclearance uh, from that act. Uh, that's an important word. Uh, what it means is that the folks in the affected states, mainly the old Confederate states, were not able to make changes in any of their voting laws and regulations without preclearance by the courts. Uh, by uh, uh, lifting that, uh, uh, just Justice Roberts' court meant that any future complaints would have to wait until after an election, not before an election. Uh, and Justice Roberts said that he uh, thought after all, after almost a century, uh, there was enough uh, reform, enough changes had come about uh, in race relations uh, that uh, we didn't need it anymore. Uh, and that, that's really a big bone of contention that has motivated a lot of folks to push for restoring that uh, preclearance provision uh, in, in the law. And uh, that's what the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which he was instrumental in getting that passed. You know, Selma uh, and those protests in the South were all about voting rights. So, so that, that's a big reason why his name is on the bill. Now, is your argument um, that actually we are slipping backwards in terms of the ability of uh, black Americans in the country um, to exercise their right to vote? Unfortunately, that appears to be the case. Uh, we certainly see a lot of the old tricks that were put together during the Reconstruction period that can affect election outcomes. 
Now, that is another bone of contention. A number of people say, well, research shows that even when uh, these various uh, measures are taken uh, to uh, that appear to be racially loaded, for example, not just the uh, voter ID, but also uh, uh, the polling places where they're located, uh, the ability to vote by mail, uh, all, all of these uh, uh, conveniences, if you will, are, uh, tend to have an impact on the ability of a lot, a lot of people to vote. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the preponderance of evidence uh, shows that uh, the uh, Republicans tend to benefit from making it harder to vote. That's a general statement. But in general, though, the thrust of what Republicans are, are after would make it harder for uh, people to vote. Uh, the Democrats want to make it easier. Uh, now, some folks on the other side say uh, that uh, making it that easy opens you up to possibility of fraud. And voter fraud is, we've seen, has been greatly exaggerated as far as the actual occurrences of it. At the same time, though, we have had a big debate going on as to whether or not every measure should be taken to avoid fraud. Uh, and uh, now that debate's been further muddied by uh, the insistence by President Trump's campaign that th there was rampant fraud. Now, I think we're getting right at the heart of what democracy is all about when uh, we're at loggerheads over who should be allowed to vote and, and who shouldn't. Well, when you're fighting more about how the election is held and who gets to vote than who you're voting for, uh, that is obviously a pretty flashing warning sign that your democracy has some problems. I would say you're right, and it's, uh, it strikes right at the heart of what we're supposed to be about as Americans. Already we can see as well, this is going beyond the John Lewis Act, but when you've got uh, various lawsuits around the country and various actions at the state level, uh, going back uh, really uh, to the 90s, there was a concerted effort by uh, Republicans, and this is not a bad thing to go out at the, at the grassroots organize people, uh, run, run candidates for county races and school boards. Uh, that's a fine thing on paper. What it means, though, is you can, you can get a strategic advantage insofar as the way electoral votes are counted, uh, uh, maps and the redistricting that will decide the uh, electoral vote. About two thirds of the legislatures around the country are uh, controlled by Republicans, either the House or, or the Senate side or both. Uh, and uh, it's in those states uh, where there was a really close election this last time, uh, where we've seen real concerted efforts uh, being made to, uh, uh, for no uh, better word I can use than rig, <laughs> uh, but uh, we certainly have allegations of electors being rigged so that they will tilt in favor of the Republicans. So w if the John Lewis Act were to pass, and again, I know it does not look like it will at this point, um, w how meaningful a change, how meaningful a guardrail would that present in terms of ensuring um, that American elections going forward um, would not be subject to effective claims of, um, you know, of, of rigging or all this kind of problems that we have? We're going to have disputes over of that sort, uh, regardless of what is done. It fits a master plan without sounding too conspiratorial, but I guess there's no other way to describe it. Uh, it fits in with a master plan of, of uh, uh, making it easier for national Republicans to have an impact on future presidential races. We saw this last time, it was very close. Uh, and uh, electoral votes that uh, turned up in Georgia uh, turned out to be decisive. Uh, and uh, that was good. Georgia's current situation is the result of past reforms that enable more black voters uh, to get to the polls. But at the same time, they're already making some changes or they're debating uh, in Georgia about further changes to the law that will um, enable the legislature to decide electoral votes uh, if there is a dispute in the count. Uh, the sort of thing that President Trump's people were trying to push in this past election uh, will actually be easier to accomplish. So then all that matters is uh, which party is in charge of the legislature, really. Well, yeah, uh, somebody, maybe it was Stalin, uh, said that uh, it's not uh, uh, who, who casts the vote, but who counts them. You heard that before? Oh, sure. 
you don't want elections to go the route of impeachment, right? Impeachment has become completely broken. It's purely a political tool because it, it doesn't matter what the charges are. It only matters whether it's a Democrat or Republican um, that's being, uh, that the charges are being levied against and whether they control or not the House and the Senate. And, and what you're saying is that in state legislatures, we increasingly see some trends towards that type of behavior um, for elections. Well, well, I can go back to uh, 1876 to the end of Reconstruction when there was a disputed national election where the uh, vote did come to Washington. I was heading toward the House of Representatives. It's what the Constitution says. They get to, to decide in such uh, cases. And each state gets uh, a, one vote regardless of the proportion of votes that were cast for each party. And that didn't get that far because they had uh, that grand compromise, which essentially ended Reconstruction, the hayes tolden Compromise. The North agreed to pull Union troops out of the South. And believe me, as an African-American with Alabama roots, uh, that was the end of my family's ability to vote, uh, essentially, uh, until I was in high school. No, a broken election basically um, led to Jim Crow, basically prevented uh, blacks in the South uh, from experiencing liberty for generations. That's exactly right. And since we're not speaking in a public school in Virginia and a number of other states that, have, that are banning critical race theory, we can talk freely about this is one bold example of how history still uh, history and uh, the, the slavery period and the laws that came out of that period, including the Electoral College. Uh, this is the legacy of, of those days. And, and that's part of the big argument now. Are we going to get rid of these last vestiges of discrimination from the Jim Crow era? Well, Clarence, I mean, with due difference, I mean, I don't think we're talking about critical race theory here. I just think we're talking about American history. Well, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, uh, critical race theory was a, a bogus issue, in my view, and a lot of other people, but it, it was very influential in uh, getting the Republican governor elected there. And one of his first promises now is to get critical race theory out of the schools, which isn't even in the schools. But anything that looks like critical race theory, which means black history, or as they put it, anything that makes white children feel bad, which is not accurate either. But that is uh, that uh, uh, danger is what motivated a lot of voters and uh, continues to motivate a lot of voters to uh, want to get rid of critical race theory. Is that what it feels like to you? Does it feel, does it feel like they want to just take black history in the United States out of the schools in Virginia? Yeah, and uh, even uh, we, one, one of the big uh, motivating uh, factors in that campaign was Toni Morrison's book, Beloved, which one fellow who was out of high school but talked about how it, it traumatized him reading this. And uh, Beloved is a prize-winning book by a Nobel-winning author, and it uh, shows you the reality of what life was, was like for the slaves back in those days, but that's a little too much reality for some people. It turned out that the student who started, or former student who uh, uh, started that whole issue was uh, the son of a Republican Party activists down there, and he's working for the party now himself. So it comes up again. I'm not anti-Republican, I should point out. <laughs> in fact, my newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, helped to sponsor a young Illinois uh, candidate for president named Abraham Lincoln. And we've been very proud of that tradition. And I'm familiar with that history uh, back then. And I find it very ironic that I'm reliving part of that history now. It hasn't ended. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I was traumatized by Moby Dick in high school, but it doesn't stop me from going to Nantucket. I, I feel like there are too many knickers in a twist uh, around issues that don't really exist. We, we need our kids to just learn basic issues of our country's history. How, how can they be citizens effective citizens and effective voters if they don't know where our country came from. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, that's exactly right. You know, we, we talk about being, being a democracy uh, or a democratic republic, whichever you prefer. But what does that really mean? Uh, uh, to too many of our young people, history is just 
uh, something that they have to uh, get a grade in so they can move on. I, I confess I was like that too a lot as a kid, but over time I have learned to appreciate history more and more. And I especially appreciate it right now. And when I think about how can we preserve the good things about this democratic republic that came out and are a model to the world as far as democratic rule is concerned. Uh, and uh, we're fighting those old battles again. I wanna ask you a couple quick questions. Uh, President Biden now can appoint a Supreme Court justice, and he has said it will be a black woman. Now, of course, that makes history, but of course, that's also uh, very specific and means that nobody else is being considered for that position. What do you think about that? Well, I, it's not the first time Ronald Reagan uh, said back when he was running for president in 1980 and was losing too much of the women's vote, uh, if, if you will. Uh, and he was being picketed uh, for his opposition to ERA, the uh, Equal Rights Amendment, which never did pass. But uh, nevertheless, he came out and said that one of his first choices for Supreme Court would be a woman. And it turned out that came true. <laughs> Senator Day O'Connor. Joe Biden says right up front he wants to appoint a black woman, and he's been bashed by the usual sources, Fox News, et cetera. There are some like Jonathan Turley, the, the law professor, who argued against that in the Wall Street Journal, uh, saying that it violates the Bakke decision, among others, regarding affirmative action. That was an uh, important decision back in the 70s, that uh, now affirmative action is before the court now again. But Turley's point is that this is racial discrimination on the part of Biden's actions here. And uh, the, uh, the fact is that the Bakke decision itself said that to use race as a criteria alone, I'm not quoting word for word, but to use race as, as a criteria is uh, discrimination that's uh, unconstitutional. And uh, I argue back that Biden isn't saying that just being black is enough or just being a woman is enough. They got to be qualified first. And Turley himself says that, that the three names that have come forth uh, at the top of Biden's short list are all qualified. But it's too bad that they can be stigmatized now by the thought that they got their job because of their race. No, it was clearly just red meat in terms of identity politics. And so that was that was why I raised it to you. One other question I wanted to ask you before we close is about um, former President Obama. You know, we had massive black turnout uh, when he was running for president, when he was president. It's gone down recently, but we also haven't seen much from him. I mean, we've got Trump who can't wait to get back on social media. Meanwhile, Barack Obama seems like he's enjoying being on vacation. You know, he can do whatever he wants, a private citizen. He's Lord knows he's earned it. But uh, how do you feel about the fact that we haven't seen so much of the former president at this point? I've got uh, a nuanced view here, Ian. I covered Obama from the time he first began to run for the state Senate and then right through his presidential campaign and his presidency. I, too, wish he was more involved, along with uh, Dave Axelrod, who I used to work with the Tribune years ago, and other folks who were so brilliant at helping to get him elected. But at the same time, you know, we really need some fresh blood. We need some new blood. Look at the age of our president now, uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi and various other leaders, Republican and Democrat. There is a younger generation that's itching to come forth and be more involved, some great talent. I want to see them get out there, get more actively involved in helping to generate the next generation, like the Republicans decided to do back in the 90s, and now it's paying off for them. Clarence Page, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate it. That's it for today's edition of the G Zero World Podcast. Like what you've heard? Come check us out at gzeromedia.com and sign up for our newsletter, Signal. The G Zero World Podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, understands the value of service, safety, and stability in today's uncertain world. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. G Zero World would also like to share a message from our friends at Foreign Policy. How can sports change the world for the better? On The Long Game, a co-production of Foreign Policy and Doha Debates, hear stories of courage and conviction both on and off the field directly from athletes themselves. Ibtihaj Muhammad, Olympic medalist and global change agent, hosts The Long Game, 
Hear new episodes every week on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to the G Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of GZero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, GZero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.